Oh yeah, well, let's come to uh, pray together. Let's uh, come before our Lord. Gracious God, we thank you this evening that you have kept us through this day. We thank you for uh, giving us, O oh Lord, our daily bread, for being our faithful and good uh, God. We come, O oh Lord, now uh, to this prayer meeting, and we desire, O oh Lord, to know your presence and your help, O oh Lord, as we come to study your word uh, in the Bible, says he. Point us then, Lord, to the greatness again of our salvation and help us to be like the Apostle Paul when he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. Help us, O oh Lord, to rejoice in the blessings we have uh, in our salvation tonight. Hear us then, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. turn then to Ephesians chapter 1 and uh, I'm going to read from verse 13 uh, to verse 14 so 13 and 14 tonight uh, we won't finish the uh, two verses but we'll begin uh, verse 13 uh, this evening so verse uh, 13 in whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that he believed, he was sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance 
until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So uh, we're continuing then in Paul's uh, great statement here concerning our salvation. He begins by blessing God for the blessings that he has uh, poured out upon us uh, in salvation. And then he goes on to open up what God really has done, what God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has done. So God the Father has planned our salvation. He's chosen us, uh, predestinated us to be uh, his sons, accepted us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, has secured our salvation by coming into the world and redeeming us, that is, to deliver us out of the bondage, slavery of our sins, uh, through paying that ransom price upon the cross to free us. And so in Christ we have redemption, we have the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, he's abounded towards us in wisdom and prudence. He's given us spiritual understanding to uh, uh, accept and and embrace and love the word uh, of God. And then uh, we saw last week of the inheritance we have in the Lord Jesus. He's given us heaven. Uh, we have tonight eternal life uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. No one can snatch that from our hands. We have it. And we're waiting for that day when we shall enter, as it were, into the full sort of possession, enjoyment of it. Uh, in heaven uh, itself. Now, the final section really comes in verses 13 and 14. And here the focus is upon how salvation is applied to us personally. Uh, the focus is upon the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, verses 13 and 14 teach us something of the work of of the Holy Spirit. Uh, salvation has been secured for us, now it's going to be applied. And how is that salvation applied to us as individuals? Now we come into verses 13, uh, especially, uh, this is uh, a verse that is a little bit controversial. So we're going to look at it and uh, I'm going to try and explain what I think it means uh, as far as I see uh, what Paul is saying here uh, in Ephesians. But let's uh, look really at two things tonight I want to look at. Two things. I want to look at faith. And then secondly, I want to begin to look at what we call the sealing of the Holy Spirit. So uh, the first bit is faith, and then the second bit is sealing with the Holy Spirit. So first of all, then, uh, faith. If you look at verse 13, it says, In whom he also trusted, after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And so Paul says uh, to us now, how? salvation becomes ours. God has planned our salvation. The Lord Jesus has bought us, has secured our salvation upon the cross. How does that, uh, how do we secure it then? How does it become ours personally? How are we saved? Here salvation is being secured, but how do I receive or enter into all the blessings now of being saved here in this world. And Paul tells us how. He says to these Ephesians, first of all, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So the gospel or salvation is revealed to us in the word of truth, in the Bible, this is the word of truth. God speaks his word, and it is a word of truth. It is a word that is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
There's no falsehood, no lies in it whatsoever. All that God says is true. And that truth is in his word that he has spoken. He's spoken through the prophets, spoken through the apostles, spoken supremely in his son, the Lord Jesus. We have the word of God written before us tonight, the Bible, and this is the word of truth. And what especially makes it wonderful is this, that it speaks to us the gospel of our salvation. It speaks to us the gospel, the good news. We turn to the word of God and it is good news. It is the gospel. It is good news of great joy. Because it speaks to us of salvation. It tells us that we are in great danger, in great need because of our sins. It tells us that our sins have separated us from God, that there is a consequence for that. Uh, the wages of sin is death, and so we're in great, great danger. But that God has sent his Son into the world to, to deal with, with sin, to deal with death, to deal with the grave, to deal with hell, and that there is a way to be delivered out of this danger to a place of absolute safety in the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us how to be saved. It is the gospel of our salvation. And it is the gospel of your salvation, says Paul. Because it doesn't speak about salvation in some sort of abstract way, some theoretical way, as an academic would speak about it in his ivory tower. No, it speaks of salvation personally. It says, you can be saved. This, this gospel, this salvation, this being rescued from, and delivered from uh, the danger we're in to being completely safe in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to being forgiven and to have an eternal life, this salvation is offered to you in the gospel. It can be yours tonight. It can be yours, as, as Isaiah says in chapter 55 of Isaiah, he says, come. Buy milk and wine without money and without price. It's yours freely. In this world, you don't get much for free. If you go on online, there are some adverts, and it says you can have this. I was looking um, uh, this week, and there was this advert that stood out that said, £40,000 for uh, Home Improvements Green Initiative. And I thought I'd click on it. Because I thought, wow, you know, a grant from the government. And soon, as you read the small print, you discovered... Is not free at all. But this gospel, the salvation is offered freely to us, is available tonight to all who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, it's the gospel of your salvation because uh, this gospel says, come and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It invites us to, to, to avail ourselves uh, of salvation. So as Paul would write in Romans chapter 10, I love these words in Romans 10 and verse uh, 8. But what saith uh, this word of salvation, this righteousness that comes through faith? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. There it is. And the word says, Paul, is nigh, it's near to you. It's not far away. You don't have to climb the highest mountain. You don't have to climb Snowdon to get it. You don't have to dive to the depths of the sea to, to try and get it. No, it's near to you. So near you can, you can grasp it tonight. And have it tonight freely. So Paul says, this word, of, uh, this word of truth, the gospel of your salvation is available. 
But how did it become ours? Well, look at what Paul says in verse 13. In whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth. You hear the word of truth. And that means something more than simply listening to a sermon. Because there are many, many people who listen to sermons, but never hear the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation. Sometimes it goes above their heads. Oof. Sometimes they shake their heads and say, I don't believe it. More likely today, it's complete apathy towards this message. It really doesn't sink into the heart at all. There's a complete apathy. They say, thank you very much at the door, but it doesn't affect them in any way. What's needed? Well, Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And here's where the work of the Holy Spirit comes in, you see. Because as the word of God is preached, as this gospel of salvation is preached, as the gospel call is issued, and is issued to all the free offer of the gospel, so the, the preacher says, come, and he invites all to come to Christ. You in your witness for the Lord Jesus says, you can have salvation if you believe. The Holy Spirit works to give us years to hear, hearts to uh, believe, minds to understand. It's the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. And so you actually hear the word of truth. And you say, it is the word of truth. This is not lies. This is truth. And you hear it as the gospel, as good news. Ah, to begin with, perhaps it's bad news because you're told that you're a sinner in the sight of God. But that's good news in itself. Tis grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. And it's good news because it says you can, you can have the forgiveness of sins in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, believe, you, 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 you hear it. And it's as if God is speaking to you with the gospel of your salvation. You're not concerned when you hear it about so-and-so down the road. No, you're concerned about yourself. This is for me. I can have it. I can know everlasting life. I can receive it. I can know God. I can be forgiven. It's a, it, it concerns me. It's my salvation. And so you, you hear it for yourself. And then what happens? Verse 13. In whom he also trusted. In whom he also trusted. You see, this gospel tells us to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be saved. And so you trust the word of God. You trust the bare word of God. You take it as it is. And you trust it. You put your confidence and your hope in it. You say, this word tells me that if I believe in Christ, I will be saved. That if I come to him, I can have the forgiveness of my sins. And I trust the word of God. I don't doubt it. I trust it. I say, I'm going to believe this. Believe it, O oh sinner, believe it. Believe the glad message. It is true. And I say, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to put my confidence in it. And then I act upon what this word says. Because the word tells me to go to Christ. And so I go to him. And I trust him. I trust that he has died for, for, for sinners on the cross. I trust that he has shed his blood for the forgiveness of my sins. And I trust him. I come to him. I cry out to him. I receive him as it were. And what happens? Well, in the word of the hymnist, the vilest offender 
who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. And so I receive pardon in believing. And I am saved. I'm actually saved. So this is how this salvation that's been secured by Christ has been planned before the foundation of the world. It's been secured by Christ on Calvary. How does it become mine? Through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. It becomes mine because I hear the gospel of my salvation. The Holy Spirit works so that I actually hear and embrace it as the truth. And I go to Christ, I trust him, I believe upon him, and through faith, alone in him, I am saved. So that's how the gospel becomes, or the salvation becomes, ours. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, regenerating, convicting, converting our souls. But then Paul goes on, to describe another work of the Holy Spirit in verse 13 and 14. Now, I want to stay with this for a, a while tonight and then look at it again next week. Because Paul says in verse 13, In whom he also trusted, after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that he believed, he was sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. He was sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, as I said, there's been a little bit of confusion and controversy over this verse. We'll speak about it a little uh, in a little while. But Paul is emphasizing now the act of being sealed with the Holy Spirit. Being sealed. I suppose it's good to ask, first of all, what it means to be sealed. What is a seal? I'm not speaking of the animal. But I'm speaking about the stamp, the seal. And in Paul's day, the seal was used in four ways. That I think is helpful if we understand what Paul is trying to say here. First of all, a seal was used to authenticate a document. To prove it was genuine. So a man will put a seal to a document. It's the same today. If you think of a, of, of a passport. You've got digital seals now. But, but they put it under the, some sort of ultraviolet light, don't they? You, you stand at the customs desk. And they take your passport and they put it down on, on a glass screen. And they check it. Because there is some uh, mechanism within that page of the passport that there is a seal upon the passport to prove it's genuine, to prove that uh, that is not something you've made, but that it is a genuine document issued by the passport office. So a seal was used to authenticate a document. To prove something is genuine. And then secondly, a seal was used as a mark of ownership. And I think Paul is especially thinking, because he's already told us about redemption, which is delivery out of the slavery of sin, by the payment of a ransom price. And if you think of slaves in those days, the owners of those slaves would actually brand them. Just in the same way as cattle now or sheep are branded. Well, cattle are branded in certain countries. You have um, 
farmers with sheep, they, they spray them, don't they, with a certain mark. And it's a mark of ownership to say that you are this person's possession, that you belong, you are, you are owned by a person. So it's to authenticate, to prove something's genuine. It's a mark of ownership. Thirdly, it was used to show that a transaction was complete. So if you undertook a business transaction, there would be a seal put upon the transaction to prove that it is complete, that, 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 that uh, the transaction has been done. And you use that phrase today, don't you? You speak about sealing a deal. The deal has been sealed. Well, what do you mean? Well, it's been stamped with a seal. It's, it's the, 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 the transaction has been done. It's been sealed. I've sealed the deal. It means it's all done. It is done. The great transaction's done. Bear that in mind. And then last of all, a seal was used to secure something. To secure a document. So, so, uh, and today, uh, again, you know, sometimes um, uh, um, you have a, a very precious document, you put it in an envelope, and then you seal it. And the person receiving the document can, can see your seal that it hasn't been tampered with, it hasn't been opened, it hasn't been um, 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 sort of um, nobody else has got in there. It's been closed, it's been sealed, so, so that the document is preserved. Now put all that together, and to be sealed means to be marked with the stamp of ownership. To make something genuine, to authenticate something, to uh, prove that something is genuine, that a, the transaction is complete, and that you are secure and safe and preserved. So this is what sealing means. Sealing then, when we think of it in biblical terms, marks us out to be God's possession. It confirms the fact that we're the genuine article. That we really are a Christian. That the transaction is complete. It is done, the great transaction's done. I am the Lord's and he is mine. He drew me and I followed on, charmed to confess the voice divine. And that we're secure then as one of God's people in this world. So what I want to, you to notice now when you come to verse 13, when we've spoken now of, of that seal, look at what Paul says. In whom also after that he believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of Promise. What I want you to notice is that the Holy Spirit himself is the seal. The Holy Spirit himself is the seal. Ye were sealed, says Paul, not by the Holy Spirit, but with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit himself is the seal, and somebody else does the sealing. And who is it that does the sealing but God? God does the sealing by sealing us with the Holy Spirit of promise. God 
God seals us. He places his mark of ownership upon us. And that mark is not a mark of some red wax, but it's the mark of the Holy Spirit. He gives us the Holy Spirit himself. So the Holy Spirit is the seal and God seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise. And when does he do that? Well, if you look at what verse 13 says, he says, In whom also after that he believed, he was sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So we're told that God does this after that he believed. Be very careful with that phrase. Because the word after is not in the original. The original really means in believing ye were sealed. In whom in believing ye were sealed. There's no sort of gap there. And I'll come to that in a moment because I need to emphasize uh, this. So what Paul is saying is this. You heard the word of truth. You trusted that word of truth. You came to the Lord Jesus Christ. You believed. You trusted in him. And when you trusted in him and believed upon him, God sealed you, put a mark on you, to, to confirm that you are his, that you are the genuine article and not fake. He sealed you, and the seal that he sealed you with is the Holy Spirit. Because when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit himself came to dwell in your heart. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God so the moment you believed in Jesus, God sealed you. And he sealed you with the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to, to dwell in your heart as the mark that you are his. To authenticate the fact that you are a genuine Christian. To say the transaction is done, that you are now the Lord's and he is yours. And to secure you and preserve you for all eternity. And that happened when you believed. It happened at conversion. It's the distinguishing mark of the believer. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he says, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. It's the distinguishing mark of, of, of a genuine believer. The believer has the Holy Spirit indwelling him, uh, in his heart, he is sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The non-believer or the fake believer or the delusion believer who's really not a believer does not have the Holy Spirit of God. And that's the difference. Now why do I emphasize that? Well, because... There are some that teach, and they are good people, some of them. I've got to say, they're marvelous. But there are some who teach that this is a separate work post-conversion. And it's a work that happens to some Christians, but not others. And it's a second work of grace that we should seek and seek and seek and seek after. So it's something we need to work towards. It's a, a baptism that gives special assurance and special fruit. But it's something that takes place after conversion, maybe years after conversion. 
Now, I don't believe that that's what Paul is saying here. And I'll tell you why I don't believe that's what Paul is saying here. I'll give you some reasons. First of all, Paul is speaking of something that has happened to all Christians. That's the context of the passage. If you look at verse 12 and verse 13, he speaks of uh, those who are first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that he believed, he was sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And the, the, the idea that Paul is using when he uses the word also is that he's saying to them, um, we were sealed, I was sealed with the Holy Spirit when I believed. So too were the saints in Jerusalem, so too were the, other, the, the, the saints in Samaria, so too were the saints in Antioch. And you too, when you believed, you also were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In common with all other Christians. So he's not sort of saying that this is something that has happened to a few. But he is saying this has happened to every Christian. And he uses the word, doesn't he? In whom uh, also, after that he believed, ye were sealed. Not some of you were sealed, but some of you need to be sealed. Or a few of you were sealed, and some of you need to seek after it. But ye were sealed, all of you. As we were sealed, as other Christians were sealed. And then the second reason is this. If you look at verse 3, what is Paul doing? Paul is telling us and is telling the Christians in Ephesus that they have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And he's telling us tonight that if we're Christians, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And he goes on from verse 3 into verse 4 and so on to tell us what those blessings are. And they are blessings that are shared by every single Christian. He tells us of the blessing of election. And he's not saying some, of, some Christians have been elected but some haven't. No, if you were a Christian, every single one of you have been elected before the foundation of the world. He goes on to speak about adoption. And he doesn't say, well, some of you have been adopted, but others haven't. No, it happens to every Christian. This is a blessing of salvation. It's been planned. He goes on to speak about redemption. Redemption isn't something that happens to some Christians, but not others. If you're a Christian, you've been redeemed. This is a blessing of salvation. And he, he's listing the blessings of salvation. He then tells us that you've heard the word of truth. That's a blessing of salvation. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to, to regenerate us, to bring us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he finally says you've been sealed, which is a blessing of salvation. It's a blessing that's given to all Christians. He simply opens up the fact that we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the Lord Jesus Christ. So where does the confusion come in? Well, I think the confusion comes in here in verse 13 because people mix up the seal in itself with the effects and the result that that sealing produces. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is this, that when... We believe God seals us with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells within our hearts. That's the sealing. And having come to indwell our hearts, having come to live in our hearts, the Holy Spirit then produces certain fruits. 
There are effects of the Holy Spirit uh, indwelling in the heart. We're given consolation. There's the, the, the comfort, comfort of the Holy Spirit, the strong consolation of the Holy Spirit within us. Um, it is he who enables us to cry out, Abba, Father. It is he who produces the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Is he, he's the Holy Spirit, so he sanctifies us. And he works in us to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. It's he that produces uh, assurance and gives us assurance. And so on. So, so the Holy Spirit works then within us throughout our Christian lives. But the sealing takes place at conversion. And the Holy Spirit... Because our salvation is a personal salvation, works. Uh, yes, he works in, in, in the same way, but uh, also in a unique way in, in individual Christians. We all have different experiences as Christians. And so we're in need of different uh, comforts at different times. And uh, there can be seasons when we go through various trials and troubles where we need an assuring work of the Holy Spirit in a different way to another Christian who's not going through the same trial. And so the Holy Spirit works in us as individuals in that way. And at times he blesses us. There are seasons of blessing in the Christian life where the Holy Spirit, is, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given us. And that happens uh, in one Christian at a different time to another Christian at different periods uh, and so on. But that's all the effect. That's all the result of this one fact that is true for every Christian, that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. He's been sent, given to us by the Father, and we're sealed with him when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I, I want to emphasize that because as I said, it's led to confusion, but also it's led to, at times, frustration. And I would say, uh, deep sorrow in the hearts of some Christians. Uh, I can, if I can give my personal testimony, that for three years I was in a certain church that taught that you needed a, a, a second baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that would produce uh, speaking in tongues and other such things. And for three years I thought, well, I, I really am not the genuine article. I saw others. And I saw that I didn't have that. And I thought, well, there's something completely wrong. And I'm not genuinely saved. I'm not genuinely a Christian then. And I believed, and I can remember saying, I believe, I believe, I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, my, my, my faith is in him. And yet, I can't be because I haven't got this sign and I haven't got that sign. But the fact of the matter is this. That I was a genuine Christian. Because this sealing does not take place in some special way years after you're converted. But it is God putting that stamp upon you that you are genuinely his at conversion. By giving you the Holy Spirit to dwell within you. And then that Holy Spirit will produce his work. And you will see the effects. And they will be objective effects. 
and also subjective effects. Certain things will follow, and you will also have certain experiences that the world knows nothing about as a Christian. And uh, you will have special times and special seasons where the Holy Spirit works in special ways. But it all begins when the Holy Spirit is given to you at conversion. Well, we'll continue next week looking at this because I want to look at those effects next week. I want to know what this ceiling, we're going to ask next week, what does this ceiling produce in the individual? What are its effects? What are the results of this? And we'll see uh, something of them next week. Uh, but uh, we're to thank God again for uh, this blessing, the blessing of having the Holy Spirit, the blessing of knowing that he is within us, working. And we shall praise God and thank God for him. While well, we continue with Ephesians next Tuesday evening.